Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening to all of you. Um, I'll begin with an, a traditional Arabic praise that is uh, customary for Muslims to do when they speak. Uh, it's, the purpose of it is to bless any speech that we do and produce good out of it. And that is Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. I was asked to speak to you folks um, for 30 minutes, which seems to me like a daunting task. But um, I will try and speak to you. And the topic that was given to me, rather scary, it was called Islamophobia. Uh, if, which, if you may not know what that is, is essentially a, an irrational fear of Islam. Um, Muslims that are in this audience are probably more sensitive to that reality than non-Muslims are of how that fear has grown over the years and how uh, just the way we're perceived generally in society has changed. Uh, you may not have realized how that perception has changed if you're non-Muslim, but certainly as Muslims we have seen a very strong or very rapid exponential progression in how uh, Muslims are perceived. I happen to travel quite a bit. Um, it's slowed down now to once a month, but I practically traveled every weekend for the last six or seven years. So I've had my share of airport adventures over the last six or seven years, and um, my share of strange looks as I board planes and things like that. But uh, I'd, I'd rather talk to you today about some very fundamental, basic things, and present my thoughts in an organized fashion. So when we do get to the questions and answers, I hope to address some of my thoughts that, that uh, you may like to uh, get further clarification on. Uh, and essentially, I'd like to break up our understanding of Islam into a few things. And the first distinction I'd like to make is uh, Muslim behavior versus Islam. And that is essentially true of any ideology or any faith system, that there's, there has to be a distinction made between behaviors of people and the actual teachings of a religion itself. The ideals, the, the text, whatever, whatever you may have, the sources you may have, they may be two very different things. And certainly that's the case in the Muslim world. Uh, the ideals that are presented in the Qur'an, the ideals that are presented in the body of literature that is called Hadith, which essentially is a sacred explanation of the Qur'an, may very well be different from the practice you might, may find prevalent in the Muslim world. And that actually, for, for many aspects of Islam, happens to be the case today. At the same time, another distinction I'd like to make within the masses of Muslims, the Muslim population, is a distinction between the fanatical among us, and the vast majority of Muslims. And that's true, again, of any population of people. In any group of people, you'll have a small minor minority of crazies. That's just a reality of how society functions. There's always going to be some outliers that don't represent the vast majority. And one of the things I'll try to present to you is that to justify and to propagate hate-mongering against Muslims, what is used as justification is the televising and the publicizing of this fringe element within the Muslim community and they're forced as the ambassadors or the representatives of what all Muslims think like and what all Muslims are about. So that's, these are two things that I'd like to uh, discuss with you in some detail. Finally, I'd like to talk to you about, a little bit about Islam itself. And the reason, I, and I, actually I'll start with that. And the reason I think it's important to start with that, at least a basic definition of Islam and some essentials about it, is because there's all this talk about what Islam represents that you have probably already heard. I mean, it's kind of impossible that you haven't heard what Islam is about and you're sitting in this room as college students or beyond, right? Uh, it's probably impossible because it's pretty much the context of discourse. It's, it's in the content on the radio, it's on TV, it's in the news, it's even in entertainment media. So you've heard something or another about what Islam is, what its essentials are, and probably already, even if you hear the word Islam, there are a few key words that immediately pop up in your mind. And there are a few images that immediately trigger in your mind that you've already associated with Islam. And that's not your fault, but that's just it's essentially what you've been exposed to. But very rarely do we get an opportunity for a Muslim, or Muslims in general, to speak on behalf of their religion. Except, like I said before, the ones that are the, the representations of Islam that are publicized are those that don't represent the majority, that actually represent a crazy French element, and they're televised, and therefore we all look kind of crazy, and because, you know, they have beards and I have a beard, so it's very hard to make that distinction, because, you know, a fifth of the world's population, but anyhow. So, <laughs> so uh, this is the first thing I'd like to talk about, essentially, the essentials of Islam, the essentials of Islam. 
And a little bit about this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We say the Arabic phrase, when we say his name, Muhammad, we add sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's an Arabic expression, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. That's what we send a prayer upon him every time we say his name. And that's an obligation on all Muslims. And incidentally, we do this for all prophets and messengers that we believe in. So for instance, when I say Adam, the Muslim audience here is obligated to say what? Alayhi salam, may, may peace be upon him. When I say Isa, which is the Arabic word for Jesus, what are we obligated to say? Alayhi salam, peace be upon him. So we send prayers upon all prophets and messengers. When we utter their name, it's a sign of respect and a sign of awe and regard that we have for all of these noble prophets and messengers, representatives of God's message. Essentially, just a little bit about this prophet uh, Muhammad that you may have heard some pretty crazy things about. Uh, but I want to share with you some very, very basic things. I won't give you a synopsis of his life except to tell you that the revelation, as Muslims believe, began coming to him at the age of 40. And it stopped coming to him at the age of 63. So that's a total of how many years? It's a total of 23 years that this message was being proliferated in Arab society, in tribal Arab society, in the middle of the Gulf region as it's known today. The ancient term for it is the Hijaz region. region. Uh, so he starts propagating this message as a messenger of God at the age of 40, and he dies at the age of 63. And of course, he starts when somebody uh, makes the claim to be a messenger of God, and makes the claim that an angel comes and gives him revelation, as all prophets did, by the way. All prophets claimed legitimacy of their message by stating that they are not getting, this is not something they're making up on their own. This is actually inspiration, revelation given to them by a higher power. And now it's hard for you and me to imagine some of our neighbors coming over and knocking our door and saying, listen, an angel came to me last night and you know, shared this really important message that I'm obligated to share with you. It's kind of hard for us to swallow. We, the first thought that would cross your mind would be, what did you have for dinner last night? Right? So it's not, it's not rational to think that you know, uh, an angel came to you and such and such. But I want you to just picture that scenario. A man at the age of 40, well respected in his community, a good businessman, people associate honesty and ethics with him, he's fairly well known, he's, a, he's also known as one of the more intelligent, so historically when disputes occurred within the Arabs, one of the people that they would resort to to find, to say this guy, not only is he intelligent, but he's also a neutral party, so we'll go to him, whatever decision he says, we'll go with. So they would resort their manners to him because they saw him as one of the intelligent of their community. This man is now, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, claiming to be a messenger publicly. And he's claiming that revelation comes to him from a higher authority. And not only that, that's, that's hard enough to believe, he's asking something more. He's asking people not only to believe that that's true, that once they believe, they have to understand that whatever he's saying, because it's not his own words, it's the words of God, it's the words of the highest authority, that they have to submit to those instructions without question. Because questioning those words would be the same as questioning God Himself. That would be the idea of a messenger. He's exactly that, a messenger. He's delivering a message. Now, as hard as it would be to believe, even harder you would have to argue it would be to submit your life to someone like that. To just say, I'm going to eat what you want me to eat, I'm going to sleep when you want me to sleep, I'm going to look at what you want me to look at. I will live my life the way you want me to live my life. And by the way, as soon as I believe you, it's only logical that the vast majority of the community, including my own family, what are they going to think about me? What's the first impression? If I accept this man's claim right now and say, I'm with you, that is a messenger. And I am willing to change my life entirely for him. Obviously, what reaction will the family have? He's gone crazy too. I mean, the other one, he was 40, he was so normal yesterday, what happened to him? All of a sudden he's crazy talk about angels and messengers and afterlife and you know, don't do evil and pray and be good to your neighbor. And I understand the be good to your neighbor part, but this whole messenger bit is a little too crazy. You know? And then now my own son, my daughter, my neighbor, that one became Muslim too, that's crazy, it's spreading. This cult is growing, this is insane. And so this concern began in the community, this is a historical fact. And the first few things that were said about Muhammad were exactly this, he's insane. He's insane. Or he has some ulterior motive for which he is trying to capture the attention of the, the not, so, not so firm in intellect among us. He's trying to catch the, you know, the uh, let's just say the easily influenced 
among us, and he's taking them under his wing, etc. But you'll find something very interesting beyond, let's just keep the claim that he is a messenger aside. What else does he claim? What else is he talking about? Besides the fact that he's a messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa what else is he proliferating to people? What, what does he have to say? I mean, if he's asking people to change their life, what is he asking them to do anyway? Well, the first thing he comes and claims is that, this, that there is a God, but not only that he is God, but he has a direct relationship with you. And that no one can come in between you and him. There can be no intermediary between you and him. You don't answer to anyone else who can answer for, on your behalf to him. You have to answer to him directly. You owe him a direct obligation. And the first phrases of the Qur'an, not the, in terms of sequence, but if you open up the Qur'an, you open up the first phrases of the Qur'an. I was actually just teaching this to my kids the other day. The first phrase is Alhamdulillah, which means praise and gratitude in its absolute form belong to God. Interestingly, I want to mention here, uh, uh, on a side note, uh, I don't know if any, everybody here got a chance to see this video, but uh, it was released a couple of days ago by Ikna TV, and there was a fundraiser being held for homeless people, by uh, a group, a Muslim group in Los Angeles. They were doing a fundraiser for uh, the, just the homeless in the area. And there was this huge protest outside, right? And they were saying all kinds of really hurtful things. But one of the things they said really struck me. They said, it's, we worship God, not Allah. Somebody screamed that out really loud. We worship God, not Allah. And I, I was really struck by that because my assumption, I, I don't know this for sure, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that that was a Christian. I'm guessing, I don't know that. But if it was a Christian, and I don't know that it was, but if it was a Christian, I'd like to ask a very simple question. Or I'd like, I'd like you to ponder about something very basic. You know, the, the Christian faith is an ancient faith. It's not a new religion. And it predates the advent of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It predates it by six centuries. So it's six centuries older than the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Christianity came to the Arab world centuries before Islam came to it. So Christian Arabs are some of the oldest, Arab, oldest Christians in history. They're some of the oldest Christians in history. And the, of course the original Bible, which we don't have much of anymore, but the original, original Bible in Hebrew or Aramaic, as it's argued by different scholars, is the original. And of course now we have it in European languages like Latin and German and even in English, etc. But one of the earliest renditions of the Bible, pre-Islamic renditions of the Bible, one of the earliest translations of the Bible is in Arabic. It's one of the oldest, oldest, oldest versions of the Bible. And guess what name for God is being used in the Arabic Bible? Allah. Allah. The word Allah is being used by Christians centuries before Muslims are using it for God. Centuries before Muslims are using it. So when somebody screams out, it is God, not Allah. The, the word God comes from the German origin, Gott. And it came into Christian tradition far later. So if you want to talk about a name that is original to Christian, or more original to Christian teaching, and of course the Hebrew term used, if you look at Hebrew sacred text, it's Elohim. Elohim, which is closer in root origin to the Arabic word Allah. These are sister languages, right? Now what does the word Allah mean? The entity worthy of worship and obedience. That's what that means. That's what the word itself means. So, you know, how far we've, and how, you know, when we don't know these simple things, it's not a, you know, some really crazy fact, it's a very famous word. So it's not hard to look up its origin or its history. But yet, we can utter these kinds of things without even giving them a second thought. But that was a tangent, I want to come back to the subject itself. Alhamdulillah. All praise, all gratitude belongs to God. In other words, you can have two kinds of idols, an idolatry, setting up an idol, setting up any kind of intermediary between yourself and God, worshipping, appreciating, thanking, praising, anyone other than God would be considered a form of blasphemy, according to this messenger, and he claims this is exactly what all messengers taught, have this direct connection with God. And he actually even claims that he's fulfilling the legacy of Abraham. That's what he claims as well. Alayhi salam. May peace be upon him. Right? So now, there are two kinds of idols, he argued, that is argued, essentially. There are external idols, and there are internal idols. The external idols, maybe there's some deity in some theology, maybe, you know, be it, they had different kinds of idolatry in the time of the Arabs, and they had different gods for different things, like the god of wealth, and the god of 
prosperity and the God that gives you children, etc., etc., etc. And depending on who you put the donuts and coffee in front of and pray, you know, different prayers to get fulfilled, etc. They had different, you know, theologies. Now those gods, those gods, those are external idols. But the Quran came and attacked internal idols as well. The idol of one's own ego. So when something good comes to you, you, you claim that this is because إِنَّمَا أُوْتِيْتُهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عِنْدِي The Qur'an suggests I have acquired all of this because of the knowledge that I possess. It's because of my degree that I got my job. It is because of my incredible credentials. It is because of my excellent professionalism that I got my promotion, etc., etc. You give credit first and foremost to yourself. You've set yourself up as an idol of appreciation and worship. You're completely self-indulged. And there the comparison made is between yourself and the Pharaoh. You know who the Pharaoh is? Right? The, the epitome of being self-indulged, that's the comparison made in the Qur'an. So that's, the, that's one call. Not setting up an internal or an external idol between yourself and God. When praise and credit is to be given, whatever ability you and I have is actually not our own, it's a gift. And so when we're able to do something with that ability, the first credit should be given to the gift giver. And then we should, be, you know, it's, it's, no, it's not evil to take pride in what you've done after you've shown gratitude to the right source first. So you know even, uh, I give silly examples just to get the point across sometimes, but you know, when people have babies and you go over to their house and see the new baby, we just had a baby sometime, my babies, right, she's about almost a month old, people come looking at us, oh how cute, right? And you know what Muslims generally do? Just, we don't even think about it, we just do it. Oh so cute, and then what do we add? MashaAllah, oh SubhanAllah, oh Alhamdulillah. Oh, whatever God wills. Praise and glory be to God. What a cute baby. In other words, that cuteness is not... And the mother, sometimes the mother goes, Thanks. <laughs> like she had something to do with it. Like she's just sitting there in Photoshop. You know, it, she had nothing to do with it. <laughs> this is one of the fundamental calls of Islam. And actually, the, that society even had a major problem with that. I already told you, accepting him as a messenger is a major problem. But accepting the fact that all praise and gratitude should go to God and we should accept Him as our master and accept His authority and appreciate Him before appreciating anything else and there nothing can be, nothing can be between us and them that was a serious problem for that society and I need to tell you why because religion before Islam in Arabia was being used essentially as an industry as an industry, as it is today by the way including Islam some use Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism as an industry. It's a money-making field for some people. And how was it being used then? Essentially, there was this Mecca, which you probably heard of, the house built by Abraham, according to Muslim theology, and there's an interesting historical discussion about that, but I won't go into. And they had all these idols around it. And these different idols were from different tribes of Arabia. So all these different tribes would make a sacred pilgrimage to come to Mecca, to pay uh, homage, homage to their own god. Because the place to keep your gods would be Mecca. But now all these different tribes, which were essentially warrior tribes, what they lived off of was beating each other up. It was a thing. They, none of them would mess with the Meccans. None of them would mess with the people that lived in Mecca. Now what? You wonder, why not? Why would they have free passage? The Qur'an even talks about it, that the was slave. They could go on a caravan in the winter or in the summer. Why, why would it say that? Because you know, most of the time, to be safe for business trips, when you take your caravan, because you don't have you know, one-way flights back then, when you take your caravan, your camels and stuff, you'll fly either in the intense summer or in the freezing, the most freezing winter. Why? Because if you go in the tough climate, it's hard for bandits to kind of be in the road and wait on you and stuff. So they would have to go in really intense journeys. But the Arabs would pick and choose, well, this is the best season to go here, and that's the best season to go there. And they would have no fears. Why? Because if you mess with us, you know your idol back there in Mecca? You know what we're going to do with it when we get back? You know? So nobody would mess with them. Now if this call comes and says, you don't need idols. You don't need an intermediary. You can have a direct relationship with God. This entire system that's set in place, people coming, and of course when people come, what comes with them? Money. It's a tourism industry. I mean, after all, what is Orlando without Disney World? I mean, think about that, right? 
So who, who would want to come here anymore? It's the middle of the desert. There's no attraction except this, this religious site. If we lose this, the interest of all the Arabs, we have no special status left. And the money that is coming in year round is gone. So they see it as a direct threat. This, just this belief in a God directly is a direct threat. They, they make the connection between that and what they're up to. But the Qur'an goes even further. And what it does is something really powerful. And I, I, I dare use the word radical. And I, this is the, the, the main point I want to share with you today. Though there's tons of stuff on my mind, I just want to get these 30 minutes to at least some, share something coherent with you. So this call is made. And one aspect of this call, the Qur'an goes after this messenger, who is at this point being deemed crazy. He has, and very few people are following him. And there's basically warnings going out, don't listen to him, he's insane, etc, etc. People are ridiculing, ridiculing him in the streets, etc. Part of the call that's given to him is to directly warn those that are the most powerful in that society about what they're doing. You know, the Arabs had certain, some really messed up practices back in the day. For instance, they thought that having a son is a sign of manhood, and having a daughter is a blemish on your manhood. It's like a shame that you had a daughter. So a lot of Arabs, when they would have, especially higher, higher ups in society, if they would have a daughter, I think the Muslims here know what they would do. What would they do? Bury They'd bury the baby girl alive. It was a practice by the elite of that society. It existed at that time. Now the Quran comes, and this man who's being claimed to be insane, claimed to be, you know, just brushed aside, this passage is revealed to him, and he recites it out loud in public. You know, it's a passage about the Day of Judgment, when the sun is wrapped up, and when the stars start falling apart, when wild animals are herded together, when the ocean boils over, when the earth is stretched, when, when people start coming out of their graves, when graves are, you know, turned topsy-turvy. And all of a sudden, in the middle of this discussion about Judgment Day and this really cataclysmic stuff that's going to happen, what is mentioned in the middle? وَإِذَا الْمَوْعُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ And on the day when the baby girl will be asked, what crime were you killed for? For what crime was she killed? In the middle of this discussion about Judgment Day, there's this talk about the evil that is happening in that society and nobody dare question it. Nobody dare question it before these verses. And he starts directly challenging those, for example, another you know, filthy practice, was the orphan is, has no backing. You know, the orphan of, of that time was like basically the illegal immigrant. Has no rights, you can do whatever you want with him. You don't have to pay him, what's he going to do? You want to stay in this country? Get to work. Maybe I'll give you some water. You know, you can abuse the rights of those who don't have a certain status. And in tribal society, having parents, having tribe, having some backing, family backing, is your legal status. So in this tribal society, orphans were just pushed around. Orphans were like the worst kind of victim. The Qur'an comes and starts calling people out for pushing the orphans. What kind of prayer does he make? You know these religious, the, the economic elite, they had to show people that they're also very religious. Because that's what gave them their legitimacy, and then they could do whatever filthy practices they had. So the Qur'an talks about them praying to show off, and then they push the orphan around at the same time. What kind of prayer is this? Prayer is supposed to soften your heart, and this is what you do with an orphan? You know? They're so cheap, they don't even give a little bit in charity? That's what their reality is? Why is it that you, don't, you find them talking to people about religion, their religion, and calling about their God, but you never hear them talk about the rights of the poor, and the rights of the needy, because they themselves are the oppressors against the needy. The point I'm trying to make is one of the first and most offensive calls made by Muhammad وسلم, in his lifetime that is recorded history is that he called for social justice. And he didn't separate a belief in God with a call for justice. He combined these two things. It was as though if you believe in God, there is no other way but to do what God demands. And our, the God, God is a just, merciful God, and so we have to have a just, merciful society here. What he, want, what he has in the heavens should be here. That's what his call was. And that's what, you know, shook the Arab world. And here's what I'm leaving you in my 30 minute swim, even though I told you I'll talk about a lot of other stuff. But I won't. I'll leave you with this. How many years did I say the revelation came to him? And he made this call. 23 years. 
And I've given you some sort of a picture of what kind of society this was 23 years ago. Within 23 years, within 23 years, the economics, the politics, the sociology, the way women were treated, the way inheritance was delivered, the way baby girls were treated, the way children were treated, the relationship between husband and wife, the relationship between people of different races, because there was extreme forms of racism in Arab society at the time, the way different races were treated, all of it was completely transformed. I mean completely transformed. If you've ever seen a Muslim prayer, just to talk about racism for a moment, if you've ever seen a Muslim prayer, a Muslim prayer is Muslim men standing in a row. Based on ethnicity, age, what are they, what's, the, what's the standard? They're Muslim, they're standing in, is it time off? Is that what you're Okay. Is there something on there? Okay. All right. I've done this enough times. So. Okay. So you'll go to any go to any average mosque in the area. For example, in Dallas, Dallas is less cosmopolitan. I come from New York City originally, and in New York, when you go into a mosque or masjid, you'll find like 50 nations represented in every row. It's extremely diverse. It's extremely diverse, right? Even prayer represents. Like go to Hajj. Hajj is a pilgrimage every year. You might see some clip footage of it here and there. Uh, you know, on CNN or whatever, right? People from all over the world, all walks of life, that are sharing the same faith and that are considered equals, just in, in, in regards to faith, you know? These, are, you know, in 23 years, this transformation takes place. It's not that people carry his message and give it strength and establish it in society way after he's gone. That's what happens with many philosophies, by the way. A philosophical idea is generated, it's, it's uh, presented to society, Society chews on it for a couple of years, maybe decades, maybe centuries, and eventually it becomes a reality in that society. This is almost an unprecedented historical incident, where the man presenting the ideals, the man presenting the claim, himself in his own lifetime within two decades, has established a society based on those claims, based on those principles. And the sensitivity to justice these people had, what we read as Muslim children, what we read about these, the first generation of Muslims, it's incredible. I, mean, I know I said this last thing. Let me share you a quick story with you. I promise I'll stop after that. I promise. And who's not even here? Oh, it's here. Eesh. That's a challenge. Okay. The, the aura hasn't reached you yet. Okay. So I will I, I'll share this really quick story with you. So one of, the, one of the closest companions of the Prophet, very high up, very highly regarded in the community, ended up, he was living in Medina, and he ended up in a dispute with a Jewish man. He was walking by and he saw the Jewish man hold a shield. You know, sword and shield back in the day. He looks at the shield and goes, that's my shield. I've been looking for that for months. And the Jewish man goes, no, this is my shield. What are you talking about? So they get into it. And they go to the ruler, who's of course Muslim. They go to Umar bin al-Khattab, Umar. They go to him and they say, you need to, you know, we need to go to this, take this trial before you. The ruler back in the day was also the judge. So they're at the Supreme Court at this point, And the Jewish man is standing there and Ali is standing there and of course, Omar knows which one really, really well at this point. He, knows, he doesn't know the Jewish man. He knows, and they go way back. They fought in battle together. They lived, you know, they've lived many years together. They've been by the side of the Prophet together. They're very close. And in, in, in the Arab world, one of the ways to give people a nickname is to call them by their son's name. Oh, father of so-and-so. Okay? So, for example, so instead of calling him Ali, he calls him Ya Aba Hussein. Ya Aba Hassan. So what's the deal, father of Hassan? And that's a, way, that's a term of endearment. It's a term of endearment. So he, obviously, because he knows him, he used that term. And he tells him a story. He tells him what his perspective is. This shield is mine. I lost it. This guy had it. it clearly it's mine. You know, I, you know, he makes his case. Now he goes to the Jewish guy. And he says, so what's your story? What's your story? And Ali stops him. He goes, wait. You called me by a nickname. Why'd you say to him, hey, what's your story? You should have called it by a nickname too. You're not just, I don't want this case, you win. Walks away. He walks away. They're sensitive to justice. They are, this is what we're taught as children, about how, how sensitive you have to be to principles of justice. How sensitive you have to be. Because that is the backbone of this religion. What gave it its strength in the be very beginning was these two things could never be separated. You couldn't be a strong believer in God and then not be just. Because you have to answer to Him. There's a day of justice coming. 
You know one of the words for judgment day in the Arabic is yomuddin? In the first surah, yomuddin. Deen means when everybody gets exactly what they deserve. Exactly, penny for penny what they deserve. So a Muslim is cognizant of that and becomes extremely worried about delivering justice to others. Delivering justice to others. This is, this is the heart of the religion. It's at the heart of the religion. And this conversation, unfortunately, I'll be honest with you, isn't common. Not among Muslims and not among non-Muslims. And it's a tragedy to the religion itself. I started by saying there's a distinction between Muslims and the religion. The texts itself. The sources themselves. An honest study of the texts, an honest study of the text yields a very different picture than what you may be used to seeing. So I, I would encourage all of you to take some time out and uh, read about the book, read about the Quran on your own time, on your own terms, on your own terms, and make up your own mind. Instead of, you know, when somebody already has a, has a conclusion made, I will present the religion from a point of view of faith because I'm a firm believer in it. So I have what you call a faith bias. But at the same time, somebody who hates Islam is going to talk about Islam and he has a hate bias. Bias is bias. So you need to come to it, leave us aside and read up on it yourself. Make up your own mind. Don't let anybody else make your mind up for you. And one of the, one of the books I'd really like to recommend to all of you, written by a, a wonderful professor out of Youngstown University in Ohio, is Select Passages from the Quran. Select Passages from the Quran. Easy reading. It's published, I believe, by the University of Michigan. I could be wrong about that. But it's an excellent book, uh, an easy read. It's not preachy at all. It's just talking about the Quran from a literary point of view. So those who are interested in the book as a primer, as a first-time reader, it would be a phenomenal resource. I sincerely thank you for paying attention, even though food was here. So, um, and I apologize for taking over my time. After the food is being delivered and you're you know, munching away, then I'll, I'll welcome any questions that I'm able to answer. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum.